down at your feet. Look at your shoes. Everybody, come on, actually look at your shoes. Okay, now imagine underneath your shoes, you've got the floor. Underneath that carpet, you've got the wood. Go down a little further, you've got wood. Eventually, you're going to get down to the foundations, ways down. Underneath the foundations, you have dirt. Just think about this. You know, you've got multiple layers going down. If you go through enough dirt, eventually, you're going to hit the rock down below. And if you kept going, you'd eventually go through rock, and eventually, you'd get down to lava and etc. going down. But if you think about it, you're on top of this big, just like if you're on the top of a skyscraper, you're on top of a big column of rock and dirt and all kinds of stuff underneath you. You just never think about it. You think that's the bottom floor, but it's not. There's all kinds of stuff down there. And you don't really have to go very far to see that, like uh, go down to Falls Park, just five minutes walk down here, and you'll see the Reedy River cutting down through the rock. If you could somehow cut even further, you'd find that the layer of rock that the Reedy River cuts through is only the first of multiple layers of rock. Because you see, the Earth is kind of like a cake. Uh, not any cake, though. It's kind of like a rainbow cake. It's got lots of different layers of frosting and cake and you know, multiple different colors going all the way down through. And I'm not talking about just like you know, the cutaway view of the Earth, you know, the mantle and the core, everything down, going down to the inside. I'm talking more about that very thin outer layer, the crust. It's thin. It's only 20 to 30 miles thick. The Grand Canyon only goes you know, a little ways down through it. But pretty much almost anywhere you go in the world, on the continents, there are 20 to 30 miles of rock beneath you in multiple different layers. Think about that. Like drive, I don't know, drive to Clemson, and you could do that going straight down and still not get all the way through. You'd be a little bit toasty when you reach the bottom, mind you. Now, in our rainbow cake, uh, we've got multiple different layers, and the crust has that as well. Now, some places you can see that and some places you can't. Unfortunately, here in South Carolina, it's more like somebody took our cake and dumped icing on it and put trees on top of it. You can't just walk out in your yard and see the rocks. You go hiking, um, you're going to see trees and dirt, and you really can't see through to the rocks unless you've got a you know, cliff face or something where it's broken away. Um, but there are some parts in the world where you can see all the way through. Um, for instance, the Grand Canyon. Uh, my in-laws just went there recently, hiking all the way down, all the way back up. And as you go through, you go through layer after layer after layer of rock. You can see the red wall limestone, all these different layers as you go through. There are a lot of other places. Uh, there's an island in the Sea of Cortez. Um, here's Petrified Forest National Park in Arizona. And in these layers, you not only have different colors and types of rock, you also have fossils. See these tree trunks, they've been turned into rock just like your ferns have been turned into rock. And interestingly enough, different layers have different kinds of fossils. Now, there's several, going back to the cake analogy, um, there's several things that we can that, that compare between the two of them, and, and it's a fairly accurate comparison. When you first pour out your cake batter, it's going to go horizontally. It's going to be level. Um, when you first pour out rocks, they don't start as rock. They start as lava coming out of a volcano or as mud and sand, and over time they harden into rock, or the chemical processes convert them into rock. Um, same thing, they're generally level. Sometimes there's some sloping, but generally level. Uh, this is known as the law of original horizontality. Um, everything's going to be horizontal in all other things, uh, excepting. Um, you're going to have bands in the rock as you go down. Um, there are some exceptions, but that's the standard. Now, sometimes you actually have the whole thing tilted, though. If we take our cake and twist it on the side, we'll know how it was originally arranged, but it'll be in a different orientation. Same way, there are places on Earth where the rocks have literally been tilted straight up and down. They were laid down level and flat, and then over time they were bent upward. And you can go, there's a place, I think this is in France, where there's a, no, this is South America, there's, you know, 500-foot cliff with dinosaur footprints running at the side of the cliff. Now, either dinosaurs had figured out how to repel down cliffs, or the rocks were level at one time, and then they got tilted upward. And in fact, you can see that kind of effect in South Carolina. South Carolina has tons of layers of rock, and you get that layer cake, rainbow cake effect. Uh, we're on the six-mile uh, thrust sheet right now, where it's a block of earth that's been pushed up over another block of earth. And you have all these different layerings, and it's, it's a really complex puzzle to put together. Uh, moving back to the cake, um, the cake analogy applied to geology leads to a number of conclusions. Since the bottom layer of the cake is put down first, unless we do something odd like flip the cake over, the bottom layer is normally going to be older than the top layer. So rocks deeper down in the earth will generally be older than rocks higher up. We don't know how much older, but generally they're going to be older. 
So you've got younger rocks going towards the top, older rocks going towards the bottom. Also in our layer cake, the different layers of cake have different colors and perhaps flavors. No matter what way you slice the cake, if you take a bite out of the green and yellow part, and let's say that's lime and lemon, uh, you'll know that bite came from the middle of the cake. Rock layers likewise have unique characteristics such as specific types of rock and chemical compositions. And you know, you could even like with our uh, South Carolina map, you know how it's, it's flat. You're only on the surface looking down at one or two layers of rock. It's almost like you took a sword and cut that cake diagonally, but you can still see where the layers come in and you'll be able to tell by what layer you're on top of what part of the order you're in. Now the main thing that distinguishes layers though is not necessarily chemical composition so much as the types of fossils inside. Uh, the flavors of the rock are the fossils. Um, there are millions of fossils in all the rocks around the world uh, in sedimentary rocks. And you've got these preserved skeletons as the bones and various body parts and footprints of animals that, and plants that once lived in these layers. Uh, and you generally find a pattern just like you do in the layer cakes. In the lower levels you only have marine fossils like fish and invertebrates. As you go up through these layers, you start to find in sequence amphibians, then reptiles, then mammals, then birds. There's an order to it. For instance, the Mesozoic, that means middle life. It's a layer that's generally in the middle of the column of rocks, and that is where you find dinosaur fossils. You don't find dinosaur fossils below the Mesozoic. The few dinosaur fossils you find above the Mesozoic appear to have been reworked, basically dug up and then reworked back from the Mesozoic. This is where we get the idea of the geological column. Over the last couple centuries, people started noticing these trends. You know, rock A is always below rock B, which is always below rock C, everywhere we look. Even if we only see a couple rocks together, we notice that order, that pattern. For instance, rocks with dinosaurs are usually above rocks containing trilobites, and rocks containing dinosaurs are usually below rocks containing horse fossils. Um, since you can't see necessarily that much on the surface, though, you need additional data. And, and over the last century or so, you know, people have been digging boreholes. You can take these huge drills that don't just drill a hole, but cut a plug down into the earth, and you have, you know, a mile of sediment. You can look at that sediment and even look at the fossils. Sometimes there's pull-up fossils in them. Um, certainly, you know, little, you know, pollen fossils. You can look at the order. And it's been, it's, some creationists used to really kind of go, I don't know about this geological column thing, but it's pretty well established. Over the last couple centuries, it's been demonstrated that everywhere around the world there's a general pattern. There are exceptions, but generally there's a pattern of layers. Um, not every location has every layer. In fact, most places don't have all the layers. Most places have some of these that they've skipped. Uh, but they're normally in a typical order, and they're normally specific types of animals in these rocks. This is what's known as the principle of faunal succession. You normally find, you're not going to find dinosaurs down in the purple rocks down here, the Diacarian. In fact, you're not going to find anything except for soft-bodied animals. You're not going to find any crabs or fish or anything. You always find certain types in certain layers. I'll say always in quotation marks. It's a general trend. Uh, it's more than a trend. It's a pretty solid uh, observable uh, characteristic of our world. For instance, um, you remember last summer, uh, y'all, uh, some of y'all paid, uh, this guy paid a lot <laughs> for me to go out to Montana, um, and I did a fossil dig. And you remember I was dealing with certain types of dinosaurs, Tyrannosaurus and Triceratops and uh, Edmontosaurus. These guys from the top layer here, um, you never find these with certain other types of dinosaurs. You see you've got a Stegosaurus and an Allosaurus and a Sauropod dinosaur here. You're never going to find them mixed, or at least the Diplodocid Sauropod dinosaurs. They're always in separate fossils. That's why, you know, in the old movies, you might have Tyrannosaurus fighting Stegosaurus, like Disney's Fantasia, but you don't find that in real life. Tyrannosaurus isn't found in the same fossil layers as Stegosaurus, ever. You know, nobody's ever found the two close together. Uh, when you find Allosaurus, it's always with the sauropod dinosaurs. You never find Allosaurus and Triceratops together. And that's a consistent trend. It's not just something that evolutionists thought up. I can go out there in Montana or Colorado and I will always only find certain types of dinosaurs in certain rock layers. Um, so, And um, you go down below the dinosaurs and you have other things like these bizarre creatures called therapsids. And they're in certain rock layers around the world. And, and these rock layers are pretty uh, extensive. You know, you can find this type of rock layer with these types of animals, these general types, in Russia, in the United States, in Africa, they're, they're, it looks like they're global. You have this layer everywhere you go in the world. Not every location in Russia, but there is some of that type of rock somewhere in Russia. Now everything we've described so far is simply observations. 
In other words, it's not creationist, it's not evolutionary, it's just observations of the world around us. Now we're going to go beyond and make some assumptions. But they're going to be reasonable assumptions based on the data we observe. Um, and remember, not everything that's reasonable is true. Uh, some things appear reasonable on the surface and they have problems. But let's go back to the cake analogy. Assuming the cake layers are laid down at a uniform speed, the number of cake layers and the length of time to lay down each layer could be used to get some idea of how long it took to make the cake. For instance, let's say I walk into the room, you're putting the last layer on and you're icing it. And let's forget about the icing on the side. Um, I watch you take about 10 minutes to put that layer down, put the icing over the top. And you go, okay, took you 10 minutes to lay that layer down. And there are eight layers. It probably took you about 80 minutes to make this cake. All other things, you know, with, as long as we're not running into some kind of unusual situation, as long as you weren't like really making it fast in the beginning, and then you start putting them slow, um, slowly later, it's going to be a reasonable assumption. It's taking you a little over an hour to make this cake if each layer takes about 10 minutes. Now, people back in the 1800s, 1700s, started looking at the layers of rock and said, hey, you know what? Rock doesn't form fast as a general thing. Generally, for a layer of rock to be put down, it takes centuries or millennia. Some, some circumstances, rock can form fairly fast, like in caves with limestone coming down. But in general, rocks form slowly. Well, if you've got miles of rock, and that rock also formed slowly, it would be reasonable to assume that the world is really, really old. Uh, generally, evolutionists think it takes a uh, thousand years to lay down a few inches of rock, depending upon the area, on average. They, they don't think that there may not be some dramatic events, floods and whatnot, but they think in general, it takes a long time to lay down rocks. And that's not an unreasonable assumption. It's a pretty reasonable, logical assumption. It's a very simple assumption. But if you look at the world today and how fast things take, and you look at the rocks we have, everything else being the same, it's logical to think, wow, those rocks are really, really old. Um, Lyell used the phrase, the present is the key to the past. He believed that today's world worked just like the world back then did. And that's generally a safe way to look at the world. That's generally a safe way on the surface level to say, okay, um, stuff today is probably going to work pretty much like it did back then. So I'll say the evolutionists, in a general sense, kind of their ideas made sense. Um, the people who looked at the rocks and thought they were old, that makes sense at a surface glance. So the theory of evolution claims as you look down through the layers of rock, you're actually doing a sort of time travel. You're going backward through the ages as you go deeper. Since each layer has a different mixture of different types of animals and plant fossils, evolution would claim that these animal and plant fossils, each layer forms a snapshot of the kinds of animals that were alive at that time. So when they look at the geological column, they assign ages. The names of these periods are not intrinsically evolutionary. If I talk about the Jurassic and Cretaceous and Triassic, those are not bad terms. Those are not even evolutionist terms. Creationists use those terms. That refers to a certain type of rock layer. When an evolutionist uses that term, he's thinking of a rock layer and an age. He thinks those rock layers were laid down at certain times. You've got, you know, of course, the Cretaceous, everybody hears about dinosaurs 65 million years ago, 66, 64, whatever. Um, they put down dates on each one of these rock layers. And by the way, I've, I've sized everything, so each one of these rock layers is actually the width of the amount of time uh, that they predict, not necessarily how wide the rock layer itself is. Um, by assigning dates to these and assuming that they take millions of years to form, evolution sees the geological column as showing evolution and extinction. Because you see, there is no evolution, there's no Darwin's theory, there, none of that can exist without the fossil layers. When you look around the world around us today, we see animals and plants that are relatively stable. We can see them changing some. We do see new species develop. We do species, see one species split into two. We see minor changes. We see, you know, domesticated animals are variable. We can take dogs and breed them into all different kinds of forms. But you can't see evolution happen. By definition, if a ape evolves into a human, it takes so long that in one human's lifetime you can never see it. So evolution is totally based on the rock layers. They look at the rocks, they think it took a long time to form, and that is where they see evolution. Without the rock layers, there's no Darwinism. The idea is, since all the trilobites are in certain layers, the Cambrian, Ordovician, Silurian, Devonian, um, I think they die out right at the uh, beginning of the Permian, um, trilobites were, had evolved and lived during that time period, and then they went extinct, and other creatures evolved and took their place after that. That's what evolution teaches. 
evolution would teach, the reason why Tyrannosaurus is never found in the same fossil layers as Stegosaurus is because Stegosaurus died out millions of years before Tyrannosaurus evolved. This is basically evolution. It's simply looking at the world around us today, seeing that animals can change a little bit in a little bit of time, looking at the rock layers and seeing lots of change, and assuming that all animals go back to an original ancestor or ancestors and slowly evolve through time. That's where we get the idea of the age of the dinosaurs, the age of fishes, periods when there were dinosaurs as the dominant life forms on the planet. That's why someone who believes in evolution would say, and this logically fits with their system, no human has ever seen a living dinosaur. In all my kids' books, when I was growing up, you know, all my dinosaur books, it said something like that. No human has ever seen a living dinosaur. Evolutionists believe that's the case because dinosaurs went extinct before humans came along. And they may say, you know, most nowadays believe that birds evolved from dinosaurs, so they'll say, well, it's a avian dinosaur, but they say non-avian dinosaurs are all extinct. Nobody ever saw one alive. Um, but there's some problems with this. One, the rock layers are not always in order. If the rock layers are always laid down, the oldest one first, the youngest one next, the layers don't always go in the order that you would expect. Um, Steve Austin, he's a creationist and he's a geologist, he notes that there are hundreds of locations where the order of the systems identified by geologists do not match the order of the geological column. Strata systems are believed in some place to be inverted, flipped over, repeated, the cake has blue, green, blue, green, blue, green, yellow, or inserted where they do not belong. You take the red out and put it down with the purple. Overturning, overthrust faulting, or landsliding are frequently maintained as disrupting the order. They say one piece of earth pushed up over another. That's what we're on right now, the six mile uh, thrust fault. Um, you have land flipped over. You have land bend and flop down on itself, roughly speaking. Um, and some instances of this do appear to be genuine. Land does fold, twist on itself. You do have some overthrust. However, Dr. Austin goes on to say, in some locations, such structural changes can be supported by physical evidence, while elsewhere physical evidence of the disruption may be lacking and special pleading may be required using fossils or radiometric dating. In other words, in some cases, it looks like it's really out of the order that you're expecting. So they, and it doesn't look like one piece has been pushed up on top of the other, so they make up some kind of explanation for it, which is okay. Every system has coping mechanisms. Every system has something that doesn't make sense. There are things in the world that I look at, and I think, I believe that the Bible's true and that the world is actually 6,000 years old, but that doesn't fit with it. So I think of ways to explain that. Every system has something that as of yet doesn't make sense. Even the truth, as of yet, we don't know everything. So evolutionists are not bad because they have ways to explain problems with their system. The problem is when you get so many problems accumulating that you should simply reject the whole system and you still don't do that. Problem number two, radiometric dating gives variable results. You see, in the old days, the layers were dated generally by the fossils. Now we have radiometric dating. People can test various radioisotopes, and supposedly that gives us sequential layers. There are a lot of problems with that. I can't talk about it because I'm not an expert. Uh, Dr. Chaffin would be the person to talk to <laughs> if uh, you have any questions. Uh, he was part of the RATE project, radioisotopes in the age of the Earth, and the RATE project demonstrates that radioisotope dating is simply not reliable. Um, I've seen weird scenarios like this. Recently I was reading about a Triassic layer where there were bird footprints and there were wading bird footprints and wading birds didn't supposedly evolve until the Jurassic or the Cretaceous. The evolutionists first said they must be dinosaurs that have feet that look exactly like wading birds and that's why they left footprints that look exactly like wading birds. Then some other guys came along and said no they're landing you can see where the toes drag as they land. And then those guys said, hmm, the layers were flipped. And they tested it with a radiometric dating, and they said, ah, the layers were flipped. That was the problem. They are waiting birds. And that's, it's understandable in an evolutionary framework, if you're convinced it works, that you would try and figure out how to explain anomalies like that. But when those stack up to the point where everything is, an, where everything is an exception, there's no longer a rule. Additionally, we know from today's world it doesn't take millions of years to lay down thick layers of sediment. If you have huge floods and earthquakes and volcanoes and various different uh, cataclysms, you can lay down a lot of sediment very rapidly. Uh, if you go back and extrapolate a gigantic worldwide catastrophe, then you could lay down the fossil, the, the geological layers that we see today could be laid down either over a long time at very slow rates or over a very short time at very high rates. 
the fact that there are a lot of rocks does not prove anything about how those rocks came about. Next, uh, dating layers by fossils can become pretty circular. One, this is an evolutionist. He said, if rocks are dated using the particular index fossils, index fossils meaning certain things like this type of clam is always found in late Jurassic rocks. You know, this, if we see this clam anywhere, then we're going to say, oh, this new layer we're digging in, that must be late Jurassic. If rocks are dated using particular index fossils, then the validity of the age assigned for the rock unit cannot be used to date unambiguously orientation or extinction events for those fossils. It can get a little circular. For example, if dinosaurs or ammonites are regarded as being confined to the Mesozoic strata, then any dinosaur bearing or ammonite bearing unit will necessarily be assigned a Mesozoic age, regardless if it's true, e.g. possibly tertiary chronological age. Uh, I was speaking with paleontologists this afternoon, and he mentioned he's seen something similar to this. Uh, he studied Lingula, which is a type of brachiopod, in, I think he said it was in Carboniferous sediments, and he said they would give it a different species name in the middle layer from, if I remember correctly, the Devonian or the Permian layer above, but he said physically they were identical. You couldn't tell the difference. It was just, it was found in this layer, and this layer, and this layer, so he gave it different names in each layer, because obviously they were millions of years apart, so it wasn't the same species. Same thing with shark species, and, and this an evolutionist was particularly noting, it's funny, the KPG boundary, that the last layer where the dinosaurs die out, it seems like the shark teeth that look the same on both sides, they're called one thing, I think Credulomnia, on one side and another genus on the other side. It's, it's kind of circular. Um, problem number five, the pattern of evolution is difficult or impossible to, t to detect in and through rock layers. Now Darwin was committed to the idea of gradualism. Not all evolutionists at the time were, and not all of them are. Gradualism is the idea that as different species evolve through the rock layers, if we zoom in, here's a couple rock layers, we are going to see the tree of life. This species evolves into this species, evolves into this species, evolves into this species, and you should see that in the fossils. If it took five million years for this species to evolve into this species, it should be proceeding at a relatively steady rate. So this one will look more and more and more and more like this one over time. They're going to look like they're changing over time. Darwin was committed to this. I think Huxley wasn't. Um, and over time, we've discovered that that is not what we see in the fossil record. Darwin, the, the fossil record was insufficiently studied at the time that people thought you would find these transitionary stages. And at least on the species level, there really is very little, if anything, in the way of transition. Um, you find a species it stays relatively the same through multiple layers of rock, and then it's gone. It po another species pops up, it stays relatively the same, and then it's gone. This is what you actually see in the fossil layers. As you dig up through 300 feet of sediment, you're going to find the species at the bottom to be almost virtually identical to the species, same species at the top. So Stephen Jay Gould and uh, I think it was Niles Elridge came along with an idea called punctuated equilibrium. It was another idea about how evolution worked. Punctuated equilibrium said things didn't evolve slowly, they evolved fast. And understand fast is in geological terms. You might have five million years where this species is the same, and then over a short time span of 10,000 years, it evolves really fast because something in the environment changes into another species. Or the two split into two different species. And it's so fast, if the rock layers take millions of years to form, and you only have a few fossils, and it's a very quick transition of just 10,000 years, you may never find that fossil of the one that's changing. So it was a, and a, I want not Gould for this. He, he's a brilliant man. And this is a intelligent way, if you believe that evolution is true, looking at the fossil record and trying to figure out, well, what's wrong? Why don't we find what Darwin thought he'd find? So punctuated equilibrium, it's hotly debated, but it's one of the ideas about how evolution takes place today. But remember, we still don't actually see the transition. We just see the fossil record with a, different species of the different layers. Now here's a totally different way of understanding that. From a creationist perspective, if we believe the world is 6,000 years old, we believe God created animals in their basic form, not, we don't believe God created species, we believe that he created animals in their basic form, and that he built in the ability to vary into other species, just like wolves have the ability genetically to change to every kind of dog we have today. Humans have tampered with that. But if wolves can change into poodles and Great Danes and Chihuahuas, then there's a lot of genetic variability there. there there's something going on. It may be mutation and natural selection. I don't think it is. It may be some sort of inbuilt ability to change rap rapidly into other species types. Whatever happened, God made multiple different types of animals at the beginning. 
they may have split into other types of animals, similar types, so each original kind of animal may have split into 10 or 15 species. But we don't really have fossils of those. The fossils we have are, if the Bible is true, there was a global flood about 4,400 years ago, and that formed most of the fossil layers. If you have a flood that covers the earth, it's going to lay down a lot of sediment and it's going to kill everything. So most of the fossils we have are from the flood. If that be the case, then what we see in the fossil record would totally make sense. We should expect to see a species start off, go up, and then disappear. Sometimes it may come back again later and then disappear again. Because the flood is going to go, it's not just like you take a giant bucket and dump it on the earth. It's going to be rising and progressively taking out different environments. So you would expect to see species that are out in the ocean be buried first, species inland on the beach buried next. You would expect to see species in the mountains buried last. So you would see species appear and then disappear. And you would see what we actually see in the fossil record. Now, creationists certainly don't have a an explanation for everything we see in the fossil record. Sometimes I'm deeply frustrated by how much research remains to be done. You know, evolution has had a century and a half to explain everything through the eyes of evolution. Creationists are just now beginning over the last few decades to go, wow, we've got to figure out how we can explain this in a creationist framework. And it's very encouraging that every time I try to apply the creationist framework to a situation, it seems to fit, and frequently it fits better than the evolutionist framework. Um, it's one of these overarching ideas that the more you test it, the more you test this hypothesis, the more it goes, wow, this fits. I'm a creationist because of the evidence, by the way. I'm not a, just an aside, I'm not a creationist because the Bible says so. I'm a creationist, I'm, I'm a Christian, and I believe the Bible because the evidence in the world around me convinced me the Bible is true, not, not the other way around. So if we have a flood that's this gigantic, horrific, cataclysmic event, we're going to see not punctuated equilibrium, but the actual fossil record, this kind of pattern. And that will explain things like the dinosaurs. Guess what? Allosaurus and Stegosaurus probably never did see Tyrannosaurus and Triceratops. At least it's very possible they didn't. Maybe they ran to each other now and then. But it appears they lived in different environments. Have you ever heard the old one, uh, why don't polar bears eat penguins? Can anybody tell me why polar bears don't eat penguins? There are no polar bears at the South Pole. Um, there are no polar bears in Southern Africa and... and um, you know, they, they southern South America, they're areas where penguins live, so therefore they never run into each other. If there were a global flood today, I would not expect to ever find a penguin fossil with a polar bear fossil. That doesn't mean they weren't alive at the same time. Uh, here's our uh, tuatara on the left. We're going to be talking about him later. Tuatara only live in New Zealand. They never have to worry about being eaten by a lion. It's not a risk unless something really goes bad. Um, <laughs> I, I have bad dreams about that sometimes. You know, that one of these days I'm going to walk down the street and there's going to be a lion. Proverbs says something about that. Um, but that happens every few years. The lion gets loose and eats somebody. Um, anyway, when we look at a museum, when we look at the animal dioramas, we expect to see certain animals in the North American dioramas. And even those, actually, some of them, you know, I don't really expect to see a caribou um, in Florida. You know, even in North America, animals are sectioned by specific environments. Um, I don't expect to see lions together with buffalo, uh, with bison, North American bison. Um, you see animals that are specialized for their specific environment, and you don't see them in other areas. Uh, actually, even this, there's a good bit, you know, you don't really see um, a bunch of giraffes walking around the forest in the mountains with gorillas. Even in Africa, there's still, you know, various little niches and various uh, sub-environments. But if you had a global flood, you really wouldn't find um, zebra fossils alongside uh, armadillo fossils in North America. You're so the fact that you find different layers, different groups of animals in different layers, in no way indicates that that's actually different time periods. Now I'm going to take a stab at a traditional creationist idea, and this is a book I had as a kid. You know, cool book, had a lot of interesting ideas and a lot of things that now we know are wrong. But when you see this depiction of, you know, people before the flood living in this peaceful world with dinosaurs and elephants and all these critters side by side, they probably didn't. No elephant fossil is ever found that we're aware of next to a Brachiosaurus fossil. And that's probably because elephants didn't live in the same areas that Brachiosaurus did. In fact, pre-flood, the world was probably even more segregated in environments than today's world is. Today's world is very mixed and basically all t jumbled up. And the pre-flood, and a lot of things have gone extinct. In the pre-flood world, it seems like there were certain areas where dinosaurs were predominant, there were certain areas where amphibians were predominant, there were certain areas where mammals were predominant, and there really wasn't much overlap. It almost looks like, you know, God creates the Garden of Eden. It almost looks like God creates multiple other locations, and then life radiates out from there. 
So when we look at the fossil record, when we look at the things evolutionists show us, they're partly right. There really is a Silurian layer where there are certain types of animals. And no dinosaurs, obviously. There really is a Devonian. They wouldn't swim too well there. Uh, there really is a Devonian layer where you have sharks and various you know, trilobites and certain species there that you don't have in other areas. There really is a Permian layer where you have various chylosaurs and therapsids, but you don't have uh, dinosaurs in that area. And then you really do have dinosaur bearing layers where you have dinosaur fossils, but even all the dinosaurs aren't all in the same layer. So there's definitely actually an order here. And, and then you have the Cretaceous. And it all is perfectly understandable in a creationist context. Uh, I don't know on the fine level how this works, but in a larger overarching view, I tend to think these creatures are further away from the ocean or at higher altitudes, and that that's what we're seeing in the fossil record, creatures progressively buried. In fact, there are a couple of uh, known ecological laws that seem to be cropping up in the fossil record, and more work remains to be done on that. So anyway, um, that was the introduction. This is what the fossil layers are. They're not, I believe, a record of millions of years of evolution. They're a record of a global flood. So problem number six, we'll spend the rest of our time on this, living fossils. Evolution posits change. Over millions of years, everything changes. Old species have to go extinct or evolve into something new. You know, every individual dies, but a species as a group is going to be changing over time. Each individual is not morphing. You know, a monkey isn't actually changing into a person. It's each one of its descendants supposedly looks a little bit more like a person. Charles Darwin talked about, Charles Darwin came up with the term living fossil. He used it twice in Origin of Species. He looked at places like Australia and saw, you know, you've got all these unique native life forms, and then when other things like rats and dogs come in from Asia and Europe, they wipe out the native life forms. They, they're more successful at competing for food and resources. So Darwin thought, you know, okay, there's this world of struggle and animals fighting for existence, and, and that's true. Uh, there's certainly a lot of struggle out there. Um, then these inferior animals are going to die out unless they're in isolated areas. Places like a small island. He wasn't referring to Australia, by the way. <laughs> On a small island, the race for life will have been less severe and there will have been less modification, less extermination. The animals don't have to change as much. Consequently, the competition between freshwater productions will be ha have been less severe than elsewhere. New forms will have been more slowly formed and old forms more slowly exterminated. So evolution will work more slowly in some areas than others. In freshwater, we may find some of the most anomalous forms now known in the world, such as Ornithorhynchus, duck-billed platypus, and uh, Lepidosiren, which are South American lungfish, which, like fossils, connect to a, cer uh, to a certain extant orders now widely separated in the natural scale. Um, so in other words, these things appear to be ancestral to some of the life forms that are around nowadays. Um, Darwin went on to say, these anomalous forms may almost be called living fossils. I'm not talking about zombies coming out of the fossil grave. Uh, they have endured to the present day from inhabiting a confined area and from having thus been exposed to less severe competition. Species and groups, and this is at the very end of his book where he's kind of recapping. Species and groups of species which are aberrant and which may fancifully be called living fossils will aid us in forming a picture of the ancient forms of life. So that these living fossils will show us what life was like a long time ago. Now let's look at some of these living fossils and see if they fit his predictions. Darwin's prediction is the isolated species can stay the same, they won't evolve. Species in other areas have to change. And in some cases he's right, in some cases he's not. Let's look. Ginkgo. Um, ginkgo biloba. It's something that some people take as a memory enhancer, supposedly. It's a tree from China. Um, by the way, my wife took part in her high school years in a study on ginkgo biloba, and um, it was in conjunction with a pharmaceutical company that sold ginkgo as a memory enhancer. They did a small study that showed no statistical benefit to taking ginkgo for your memory, and then the company said, thank you for doing the research, and they published it and said, you know, this study by Crystal Abedorf has demonstrated that ginkgo enhances your memory. Yeah, she wasn't too happy about that. Anyway, ginkgo uh, goes back in the fossil layers uh, to ex species that are not identical to living ginkgo, but are extremely similar all the way back 270 million years, supposedly. When I say 270 million years, I'm saying these are the ages that the, uh, a Darwinist or an evolutionist would put on them. Um, there's a lot of similarities. You know, when you look at living ginkgo leaves and fossils, that's a dry leaf on the left, fossil on the right, they're almost identical. It's functionally the same tree. Um, there are very few of them left, uh, aside from the ones we've cultivated and planted. They were right on the brink of extinction in China. But they're fairly capable of regenerating 
themselves in, in certain ways that they, they do seem to fit Darwin's idea about being an isolated species just on the very brink of, ex of survival. But they are very strange because they are morphologically the same. And from a creationist perspective, I st I'm going to discuss this more um, in a minute, but it's weird to think that anything, even with supposedly less competition, is going to stay the same after that amount of time. Especially something living in mainland China, which is not an isolated environment. It's strange they're not going to change and evolve if evolution works. Now, nautilus are fairly well known. Uh, nautilus are kind of iffy. They're, you know, they're relatives of octopus and squid, but members of a much larger group. They used to have tons of species, and now they're the only living handful of species. There are several different types alive today. Um, they're the only shelled uh, cephalopod alive today. And members of their general family go down all the way to the Triassic period of um, uh, their superfamily, um, Nautilacea. But the living f uh, Nautilus are only back to like the Paleogene, if I remember correctly. So it's sort of a living fossil, sort of not. It's, it, it's kind of hard to define your terms. It's the only living member of a really huge family. But it doesn't go way down into the fossil layers. So it's interesting. It's certainly strange that it would remain unchanged. It has, quote, primitive eyes, quote, primitive features. But they seem to be doing pretty well. Again, it's, it doesn't really fit Darwin's predictions about living fossils, because Darwin was saying freshwater and little islands, and these things are in salt water. And they, it seems like something bumped off all the rest of the members of their superfamily, but they're doing fine, aside from people over collecting their, their shells. Now, horsetails are a very interesting example. Um, uh, Skip said that they're an invasive weed. He's had to deal with them. Uh, they grow from, it, was it, is rhizomes the correct term, Skip? They grow from rhizomes under the ground, so it's, you can cut them all off, burn them all out, and they'll grow right back up. They're very hard to get rid of. And um, horsetails, uh, you know, these are, what, maybe 10, 15 feet tall. Um, in the fossil record, we have species that may grow to 100 feet or so, almost 100 feet, not quite. Uh, supposedly, these go back to 360 to 300 million years ago. Um, their reproductive method of, of using these rhizomes going underground and popping back up again may be one of the reasons why they're so hard to eradicate and maybe one of the reasons why they've survived whereas other horsetails have gone extinct. But they're found, uh, I found some this summer digging in Pennsylvania, in Pittsburgh, and they're found all through, I mean, they're, they're everywhere, all through these fossil layers up until today. There's all different kinds. They're very high protein, um, something like 19% protein by dry weight, and they're believed to be an important component of the food of uh, many different types of dinosaurs. Um, here's one that I found myself. It's a little hard to see, but you can see basically um, these flattened parts are this kind of squished down on a horizontal plane. In all the old dinosaur books, you've got pictures of, you know, sauropod dinosaurs you know, munching on horsetails in swamps, and it's from a very old and very unrealistic book. But these horsetails have stayed functionally just about the same for a very long time. They don't fit Darwin's idea of being... They, they are, there are very few types today compared to the types there used to be. There used to be multiple different groups of them. Now there's only one group. But it's stayed around basically unchanged for a very long time, even this specific group, not just all the groups altogether. It just, it doesn't fit Darwin's idea that it should stay the functionally the same and it, because of isolation. I, I just don't see that. And moving on is the Tuatara. This is not a lizard. It looks kind of superficially like one. It's the only surviving species of the order Rhinocephala. Uh, the sister group to Squamata, which contains snakes and lizards. So this is like the sister group to snakes and lizards. Um, when it was first discovered, people thought it was a lizard. And then in 1867, a scientist realized, whoa, this isn't a lizard. In fact, it's nothing like a lizard. It's one of the oddest creatures on the planet. Um, they have the most basic skull of any reptile. There are no specializations, you know, different reptile groups. You're like, okay, this is a turtle because the skull looks like this. This is a lizard because the skull looks like this. This thing is very, very unspecialized. They have single chambered lungs. In juveniles, they have a light sensing parietal eye on top of the head. They have more or less a third eye. Um, and they don't really seem to be exactly like any other group. Um, if you compare them to other critters, their spinal column is more like a fish's spinal column than anything else. It's similar to some amphibians, but it's not like any other reptile. Um, you look at their uh, chest construction, they have gastralia, which are r basically ribs, uh, not literal ribs, but uh, something very analogous to a rib that runs down the stomach. If you look at some dinosaur fossils like Tyrannosaurus, some mounted skeletons, they'll have a row of ribs going along the belly. Um, they share these with plesiosaurs and alligators and nothing else. Uh, 
They have some similarities to birds, dinosaurs, and ichthyostega, which is a weird amphibian, or not even necessarily an amphibian. It's kind of a hard to place it. Uh, they have uh, insinate processes on the ribs. These little uh, prongs sticking out on the ribs uh, may help with breathing in some species. And like turtles, they have no eardrum and no external ear hole. So tuataras, what are they like? Everything and nothing. They're really weird critters. They only live in New Zealand. Their numbers are very low because as people come in there and they introduce rats, well, the rats will eat the baby tuataras and you know, all kinds of critters will prey on their young. So they've actually diminished in number quite significantly. Um, they're burrowing animals. Sometimes they'll live in burrows uh, that seabirds dig. Um, and they're extremely long-lived. They have one of the lowest metabolisms of any reptile. Very, very cold environments compared to most other reptiles. They can survive in very well. Um, they reproduce very, very slowly. And they live a long time. This is Henry. He's in the uh, Southland Museum in Invercal, New Zealand. And he became a father in 2009 at the age of 111. Um, and they're, he's not enormous. They're, they're small little guys. We have fossils of tuataras all the way down through, you know, going quite a long ways back, but the most similar tuatara to the living tuatara, Sphenodon, um, is from you know, late Cretaceous sediments about 80 million, 80 million years ago. And then we have a fossil from Miocene sediments, something like 19 to 16 million years ago. So tuataras uh, are very much like a creature, supposedly separated by about 60 million years. It seems like there's been functionally little change. Tuataras fit Darwin's prediction. They fit the idea of it's an isolated animal. When other animals from elsewhere come in, they may drive it into extinction. They fit Darwin's uh, prediction, but I've actually thought of, um, and I think it was just today, a reason why that's not really surprising. Not only do these fit Darwin's prediction, most island animals uh, fit Darwin's prediction. When you look at islands, that's where you get flightless birds. That's what you go to New Zealand and you have the kakapo. It's a giant flightless parrot. It's not really capable of surviving competition with outside species. When you get isolated on an island, over time, species become fat, dumb, and happy. You know, if you don't have to fight for survival, then creatures morphologically change over time, just like humans are kind of becoming fat, dumb, and happy, and <laughs> we don't have very good eyesight compared to our ancestors, who, if they couldn't see well, would probably get eaten. Um, these island endemics like kakapo, like Galapagos tortoises and whatnot, generally fare very badly when they're, they meet with outside species. So I'm not impressed that tuataras are inferior primitive species. You find tuatara fossils with, you know, velociraptors. It, obviously, they were capable of surviving very well. I would guess that the tuataras we find today in New Zealand are actually basically very degraded. Not that they're inferior per se, but they, because they haven't had to... Um, maintain themselves, so to speak, in a genetic sense to survive, just like a lot of flightless birds on the islands. They are, they are not the same thing as what we would see in the fossil record with their ancestors. So uh, yeah, this actually fits Darwin's idea, but I think it's because basically almost all island endemics end up going in that direction genetically. Um, that being said, again, there are species that uh, has been around for a very long time and um, has changed very little morphologically. Now on some tiny stuff, and actually, I haven't the species I've focused on are all fairly large. There was an array of species that go back 400 million years or so that are all very small and you would probably find boring. So I tried to stick with species you'd find kind of interesting. These are the sea monkeys. Uh, you probably grew when you were kids and they're just tiny little shrimp that live in uh, very salty lakes around the world. Um, they're not true shrimp. Uh, places like the Great Salt Lake in Utah, they're one of the few critters that can survive there. You know, fish can't live there, but these critters survive by the gazillions. You know, you can take nets out there and scoop up their eggs and they sell them for fish food. Um, and they're basically unchanged throughout the fossil record. You look at the Triassic rocks 200 million years ago, and they're basically the same as today. And maybe that's because they don't have much competition, but during that time, supposedly from the Triassic to today, Birds have evolved, supposedly, and birds eat little critters in the water. So you would think there may be some morphological changes because their environment has changed during that time period, or at least the predators that prey upon them, but they haven't changed. Next is what you have a little bag of, triops. Triops are very weird little critters. They're not true shrimp. Um, they're close relatives of brine shrimp. Out in the desert, they live in vernal pools. When it rains, the pools spring up, the triops eggs hatch. They've been dry for months, perhaps. 
They come out and eat and grow really, really fast. They lay eggs and then they die because the pools dry up. They only have a very short lifespan and they can survive for months and months without any kind of water. And that's what you have in your bag. I'll sh uh, get with me afterwards. I'll show you how to set that up. Um, triops are basically identical. This is triops cancroformis. This is the species I got. It was difficult to get because it's a European species. It's not the North American kind. Um, and they're endangered because human development kind of makes it hard for there to be these little vernal pools. Um, supposedly they go back, triops as a whole, 300 million years. Cancroformis supposedly goes back at least 220, maybe even 250 million years into the Permian. The fossils look virtually identical to the living triops. And may, that makes it one of the oldest living fossils on an evolutionary time scale. Now, some scientists have questioned this, though. In 2009, researcher Thomas Hegna reported that fossils and living triops had a key difference. He looked at living triops and noticed the first few limbs are differentiated. They look like antenna. Those are actually feet, but they look like long antenna. Um, he studied modern triops taphonomy. In other words, he looked at them decomposing after they died. You know, if you wanted to learn how do fossils form, well, you look at living animals after they die and try and figure out how do they rot, how do they break down, what is required for them to be preserved. Um, he noticed that after they died, you could always see the front antenna still, you know, six weeks later. But in the fossils, none of the fossil triops have the front antenna. So he said, even though everything else looks just the same, they don't have the antenna, so these aren't really the same thing as modern triops. Um, if that's the case, okay. But I have two reservations. One, this is not a fossil triop. That's a dead triops that's dried up in a pool. It's in, that's not millions of years old. That's a few years old. Uh, when you look at these, sometimes you see the antenna, like this guy. And sometimes you don't. You're tucked under the body. So when I look at fossil triops, maybe I'm going to see the antenna, maybe I'm not. I would tend to think that I should see them at least some of the time, and you never see them. But here's the problem. He thinks these things died and they were buried and they got covered with, you know, they died in a pool and then later sediments came in and buried them. He's watching these dead triops just decompose in a still environment. What I would like to do when I'm done growing these triops is, uh, I have a friend who's a geology major at Cedarville. He's done some experiments on how sediment gets abraded as it, he's got basically these rolling sediment jars. I would love to stick a dead triops in a jar of sediment with sand and mud and swash it around for a while in a rolling device. I would like to see if those antennae don't get stripped off. I'm betting they will, because I assume this is the same thing in the fossil record as we have today, and it was buried in a global flood, and the antennae have been stripped off. That's something this guy's never even going to think of, not because he's not intelligent, but just because that's not his worldview. He hasn't considered that as a possibility. Uh, second objection is that people have done genetic studies on triops, and it appears that there are multiple, you know, more species than we thought, and it appears they all diverged very recently. The evolutionists basically say, this thing can't be 200 million years plus old, because given the rates of genetic change between you know, the, the mother and the daughter and the granddaughter, they're so s uh, different per generation. When you compare all of them, the differences of all the tribes around today, they must have evolved from a common ancestor very recently. In other words, the evolutionist is saying the genes can't go back 200 million years. <laughs> so this animal, even though the fossils look like they go back 200 million years, the fossils must not actually be of this kind of animal. Well, the creationist could turn that on his head and say, the genes don't go back 200 million years because the animal wasn't here 200 million years ago, and the fossils aren't 200 million years old either. So it kind of fits with our predictions. Anyway, this thing goes way, way, way back. Next, Solnhofen fossils. These are my favorites. Where I was out in uh, Montana last summer, everything was chewed up and broken and destroyed. Not so in the Solnhofen. It's in Germany. It's one of the most famous. It's a Lagerstätten. Um, it's a special preservation area for fossils. Uh, these are areas where you've got very fine grain, muddy sediments. They preserve the fossils just beautifully. Now, evolutionists think that these were shallow lagoons that were cut off from the ocean. They got really salty by evaporation, and eventually everything died in them. Bacteria couldn't survive. Nothing could survive. So when an animal fell in there and died, scavengers wouldn't get at the body and would be buried by sediments and would be beautifully preserved. That's how an evolutionist thinks these things formed. Uh, I saw a bunch at the Pittsburgh Museum, the uh, International Conference on Creationism this summer. You have things like the famous Archaeopteryx. It has prints of the feathers. You can see it didn't rot away after it died. You can see these beautiful feathers all around the body. Um, pterosaurs like uh, Rampharynchus and um, I think that's Pterodactylus. I don't think it's a... There, there were some Cotentia Cosma, but I think it's Pterodactylus. Um, dinosaurs like uh, Compsognathus. You have lizards, I think Artiosaurus. Um, various fish species, you know, preserved all the scales intact, no evidence of rotting, bloating, you know, just 
beautiful, beautiful fossils of all kinds of things, uh, sharks, um, brittle stars, very much like modern brittle stars. And you see some things like uh, in Trimpos. Uh, in Trimpos speciosus, some people think should be in the genus Pineus. Uh, Pineus monodon, the invasive tiger shrimp, is becoming a problem off our coast. They're out competing and eating our native shrimp. And it's functionally just, a, you know, that's in the middle, that's the p artist's rendition of the fossil shrimp, and there's the living shrimp. Very, very little difference. Um, and this goes back, you know, about 150 million years ago, supposedly. Um, horseshoe crab are famous. They're, they're, they actually introduce a very interesting uh, problem. Horseshoe crab today look functionally the same as the ones back then. Um, you look at, like, uh, Mesolimulus, um, very, very little morphological difference between the two. You, you can hardly tell the difference. And horseshoe crabs cast doubt on how the Solnhofen fossils were formed. Now, that evolutionist story that I told you about, um, that is the traditional story. The paleontologist I talked with this afternoon, who's a creationist, said, now understand, you know, there are the stories that people give the public, and there are what the evolutionists actually talk about themselves. He's like, the paleontologist I knew said, this place is weird. We don't, you know, basically it's an anomaly. We don't know why fossils preserve so well here. There's a public story, but a lot of evolutionists are not stupid, and they're not all, they don't all think that they know everything. Um, they're they're people. Uh, so plenty of evolutionists who are scientists readily admit we don't know everything. And, and they don't really have a good explanation for this fossil uh, layer, this beautifully preserved area. Um, as creationists, uh, I think we have a very good answer and one that actually makes at least the public explanation of theirs uh, suspect. Now you look at these, again, you've got you know 150 million years with virtually no change in the animals. And, and again, it's not like these are isolated animals in one little area like Darwin predicted. They're the same now as they were back then. Um, everything has supposedly evolved in that time. Since they evolved, you know, you've had all these new species come along, new species of shark, new species of various predators. That you'd think that they would have to change in response to their changing environment. Ocean temperatures have risen and fallen, but they haven't. And when you find them, you often find something really weird. Notice what's behind this crab. They're footprints. This is a mortaichnia. A uh, death uh, footprint track. You'll find these things sometimes up to 32 feet long, and they're not rare. You'll have a horseshoe crab walking along, and you'll see his tracks, and then he dies at the end. It's a little bit odd. It's like, you know, you come home in a work site, and you see the guy's footprints through the mud, and there's his dead body. But they're fairly common. The end is a dead horseshoe crab. And at the beginning is not the trace is lost, the horseshoe crab is dropped. Notice he didn't come from the right or the left or up or down or he's dropped. Just like boom, something picked him up and dropped him. And he started walking, but he didn't get very far. So the evolutionist explanation, the 2012 paper about this specific trackway, uh, was in the journal Ignos, concludes that, quote, a most likely scenario is that the limulid, horseshoe crab, was washed into the lagoonal environment during a harsh storm. So here are these lagoons that are cut off from the ocean, but they're right by the ocean. And they have such high salt concentrations that nothing can survive in them, not even bacteria. And they have all these fish and horseshoe crabs and ocean animals in them. So there must have been this gigantic storm that swashed them in there, but didn't churn it up so much that ocean water was introduced and it became safe to live in. It just churned it up enough that it was swashed in there and it fell and then it died in the bottom because there was no oxygen. Um, okay. And you have a lot of fish. You know, I can see maybe a horseshoe crab getting caught up. How do fish get swashed in? Why, why can't they, I mean, aren't they going to be heading for deeper water or for some sort of safety? I, I don't know, but just thinking. Um, more than that, the analogies in today's world are, are really, really, well, they're failures. Um, one, the only place in the world that's even remotely like this is a place called the Orca Basins in the Gulf of Mexico. It's a mile and a half down. It's like 47 square miles. It's this gigantic area. It's about, a, I think it gets up to 720 feet deep. It's a brine pond, an underwater pond. There's salt formations there. They're dissolving into it, and the brine is all sitting there on the bottom. And if anything goes down into it, it dies because there's no oxygen. It's too salty to live. So fish can't go down in there or, or they're dead. Um, this supposedly is the modern-day parallel to Solnhofen. It's nothing at all like it. How do you have a shallow lagoon where it's so briny that nothing can live in there due to evaporation, when in a shallow lagoon there will be rain. Rainwater is going to come down in that lagoon. There can't be rain here. This is the bottom of the ocean. It's already salty, so there's not going to be much fresh water to 
dilute the salt that's coming up and it's, there's continually more and more salt being added. How do you do that in a lagoon environment like Solnhofen? You don't see that anywhere in the world. And more than that, remember these guys. When you have salt ponds that are too salty for anything else to live in, you've got brine shrimp. There were brine shrimp around back then. Why aren't there brine shrimp in the Solnhofen? The Solnhofen looks like a catastrophic environment where in a gigantic storm, very fine sediment was laid down and trapped and killed lots and lots of critters. In other words, it looks like the evidence of a global flood. It doesn't absolutely conclusively prove creationism, but it fits better with the creationist model than any model that evolutionists have come up with. So if they want to come up with a better model, more power to them. But as of right now, the traditional model is absolutely, in my opinion, useless for understanding Solnhofen. Let's move on to something else, Willemia. This was all in the news, they talked about as the dinosaur tree. Um, it's a little bit of an exaggeration, but in 1994, uh, David Noble and uh, a couple friends were rappelling down into a canyon in Australia. He found some trees he didn't recognize, and he was a good enough, uh, he knew enough about botany that he took some pieces back, and they were just surprised to discover that it was a tree that was unlike anything that's ever been found today. It, it only looks like certain fossil species. Um, it's called Willemia, also known as the Wollemi pine. This is in the, the Blue Mountains range of Australia, by the way. The bark was really, really weird. It has bubbly, looks like cocoa puffs, he described it. Uh, it's a relative of things like the Norfolk Island pine and, and the monkey puzzle tree. It's a member of the Aracacia, which is, Ar Ar Aracacia, um, which is considered an extremely old family of trees. Um, they've been breeding them in captivity now. Uh, they're extremely rare. There's only three little groupings of them in canyons. Uh, they're in a secret location, but they've been breeding them in captivity, and hopefully they'll survive because people are putting them in gardens everywhere and guarding them because it's still a very rare tree. Um, they're in every botanical garden in Britain, in uh, Australia. Compared to other trees, uh, Wollemi pines are most similar to things like the Karai pines. These are common in like New Guinea and Australia um, and South America. It's also similar to the Araucaria, which scientists believe was a major food source for sauropod dinosaurs. So just like these horseshoes, uh, horse tails were major food sources for low browsing dinosaurs. These things are probably major food sources for the sauropod dinosaurs. Um, and there's my wife. Um, and they still, interestingly enough, some species still have foliage extremely high. It's almost like they're trying to get it out of range of the sauropod dinosaurs. Um, that being said, this is quite an incredible tree. It's not quite as dramatic as some people play it up to be almost as rare as a dinosaur, but it is extremely uh, unexpected to find these things physically almost unchanged around today. It's, it's most similar to some species found in Cretaceous layers 100 and 120 million years ago, and similar also to some family that goes all the way back into the Jurassic, but not identical. Um, and it's even possible there's a Triassic branch fossil that seems to have a very similar, you know, kind of cocoa puff sort of uh, form to it. Very weird stuff. Um, a creationist took this own and explained, okay, why is this thing still alive here and nowhere else in the world? Well, interestingly enough, um, the area where its fossils are found is in the Winton Formation, part of the Great Artesian Basin. There used to be an inland lake or sea in Australia. This was probably after the flood. It gets, there's basically a bowl of mountains. It gets stuck in the mountains. There's this huge lake. Um, and the fossils from the flood are found where this bowl would have been. Eventually, um, it was cut off from the Sydney Basin, and, and eventually, basically, the dam burst. It cut through. This is probably after the flood. You had an enormous basically dam release, you had water cutting down, cutting canyons down to the ocean. And if you had these seeds from the flood that had been buried in, you know, cuttings and seeds and all, which by the way, this plant can grow from cuttings very well. It's, it naturally grows from cuttings and seeds and broken pieces and what have you. Um, then in these canyons that are being cut, you should have the seeds of these Wollemi pines. And that is where you find the Wollemi pines today. Um, so this was Andrew Snelling came up with the idea that, yeah, it seems like these are in the place you'd expect them from the flood and from a post-flood dam burst of the Great Artesian Basin. One more, or second to last of these, uh, the coelacanth. Uh, everybody knows about the coelacanth. It was discovered in 1938. Uh, Latimeria is the only living uh, relative, and they, they found a, an Indonesian species also in, um, I think, 2007. It's the only living relative of an enormous family of extinct fish, some of which at one time people believed were ancestral to land animals. Uh, now it's that's in question, uh, even among evolutionists, but um, fascinating fish, lives in deep water, uh, known by the nationals, but they thought, um, well, this isn't, you know, they, they never told scientists that they were there until 1938. That looks very much like Macropoma, which is a coelacanth species supposedly from 80 million years ago. 
And this is very interesting because this is not a living fossil. This is a Lazarus taxa. Lazarus taxa is the coin ter term coined um, for a species that appears in the fossil record, disappears, and then reappears. Um, if you look at the blue arrow, that's this general type of coelacanth, this general family. The white is the lineage of all types of coelacanths. Um, in the late Cretaceous, and actually a little bit past the Cretaceous in the Paleogene, uh, about 50 million years ago or so, we have fossils of coelacanth. And there are no fossils, and then they're here today. There are quite a number of other species like this. Um, there are a lot of species where they're there deep down on the fossil record, and they're here again today. Whereas living fossils that are there all the way through, you know, as preserved fossils all the way through, they present a problem for evolution because things should change more than that. Because the environments are changing around these animals, they should change, yet they remain functionally the same. It's as though there is not the potential to change. In other words, creatures don't have limitless potential. They cannot evolve into totally different life forms. Uh, in some cases, it seems like they can't even change species, which is very strange. Um, living fossils present that dilemma for evolution. Lazarus taxa present the problem that there should be fossils somewhere in the intermediate layers. You should have some kind of coelacanth fossils in between, and yet you don't find any. Now, maybe someday that gap will be closed, but it's strange that many living fossils you would expect to find more of a record of. That seems to indicate the fossil record is highly incomplete. And evolutionists will say that, but it seems it's incomplete in a very different way from how they think it's incomplete. Not just little gaps here and there, but there's an enormous jump, like the flood ends and then everything after that is post-flood. Now we're going to talk briefly, I'll hurry, uh, about my favorite living fossil that I don't even know if it, it's, if it is a living fossil. I don't even know if it's a Lazarus taxa, but it may be. And some of you saw some of this last time, so I tried to limit the old information, put in some new information. Uh, I'll submit that dinosaurs are living fossils, not in the sense they're necessarily alive today, but that they are there through the rock layers, through an extremely long period, and they are Lazarus taxa in the sense that they're there in the rock layers, there are none for a large gap, and they're there back again. Look at the book of Job, it's in the Bible. Uh, it's a book about a man going through a great deal of suffering, and God speaks about different types of animals that he's made to Job in this book. It's a very old book, probably something like um, 14, 12, 13, 1400 BC. Um, excuse, excuse me, I correct myself. 18, 19, uh, 20 centuries BC, uh, time of Abraham or a little while later. And it has all types of animals in the book, including things like ostriches, um, lions, uh, the now extinct Syrian wild ass, possibly um, various... Uh, there's debate about what certain of the animals are, possibly an aurochs or possibly other species, Lasmotherium possibly, but um, it has living species and some extinct species that even evolutionists acknowledge these were alive within the last few thousand years. And then it has, right at the end, two very unusual animals. I'm only going to talk about one of them very briefly, but it's called behemoth. Uh, it's a Hebrew word, the beast. It's plural for beast. The name doesn't really tell you much other than this is a really incredible animal. Um, the Bible describes it in multiple ways. It's a poetical description, but it's a poetical description of a real animal. That's the way the Hebrews talked. That's the way that many ancient peoples did and uh, do talk. Um, it speaks about it as an enormous four-legged animal or enormous land animal, presumably four-legged. It's an herbivorous animal. It's got strong muscles, strong stomach muscles, strong bones. Semi-aquatic, which may be an exaggeration. At least it likes water. And throughout history, people said it was a hippo, it was an elephant, because these animals do like water. Um, and then it speaks about its tail. It says he moves his tail like a cedar. He bends his tail like the cedar is another translation of the Hebrew. Um, the sinews of his stones are wrapped together. He's really got tight muscles. Um, the cedar is the biggest tree in the ancient Middle East. If an ancient Middle Eastern, you know, regardless of what you think of the Bible, this is an ancient Middle Eastern document. This is something that somebody living thousands of years ago wrote. Even if you don't believe God inspired it, this is an ancient document. Um, the cedar was like the biggest tree. Uh, it was... Maybe not the largest in height, but if somebody wanted to think of what's a really big tree, we would say a giant redwood, they would say a cedar. Elephant tails are not like cedar trees. Hippo tails are not like cedar trees. Dinosaur tails are like cedar trees. If you admit any possibility of dinosaurs having been alive at the time that Job was alive, then it's much more logical to think that a dinosaur was what he described rather than a hippo or an elephant. Sauropod tails sauropods are one type of dinosaur, are enormous. Uh, it's often believed that these were used for defense against predators, and it certainly would be a very capable weapon. Interestingly enough, since the last time I spoke, I found some really cool stuff from old theologians. Adam Clark was writing, you know, seven, late 1700s, early 1800s. 
he looked at the passage before scientists ever discovered dinosaurs and was like, this can't be an elephant or a hippo. He started looking at the new, they just started digging up fossils and the idea of extinction had just been accepted. People had finally started to realize there are animals extinct. They're not alive today, they're, they're gone. They never, they're, they're nowhere on the earth, but they were once alive. That idea was a r relatively novel idea. Some people thought that God would never let a species go extinct. Um, once he got the idea there were extinct species and they started digging up these bones, these gigantic mammoths and these huge animals, he started thinking maybe one of them is behemoth. In fact, he quotes a Mr. Good who said, the behemoth in the contrary, da da da, possessing a rigid enormous tail like a cedar tree instead of a short naked tail of about a foot long as the hippopotamus or a weak slender hog-shaped tail as the elephant. In other words, almost 300 years ago, you know, over 200 years ago, there were already guys who were saying it's not a hip or an elephant before they ever discovered dinosaurs. This is not something young earth creationists in the 1960s or 70s came up with. Guys who only knew about hippos and elephants were like, huh? And then when they started digging up other stuff, as soon as the idea came along, they thought, well, maybe there are species that are gone now. They started going, maybe it's one of those because it sure doesn't sound like a hippo or an elephant. And you look at the fossil record, you look at the Mesopotamian seals from Uruk, you look at the long-necked, long-tailed animals. You look at, this is one of my favorite guys. Um, he dug up the Ishtar Gate in Babylon. Um, it's mostly in museums now. This is in uh, Berlin. They basically chopped it up, carted it away, and took it home. Um, the Ishtar Gate is covered with lions and bulls, which probably represent aurochs, the extinct wild bull. Um, and these critters, they're dragons called Mushushu. Uh, Mushusu. Older books refer to it as Shirush. It has the hind limbs of a bird of prey, feline forelimbs, a long neck and tail, snake-like head with a horn. It appears to be a weird conglomerate of animals. They're portrayed with covering of scales running down the neck. Um, and the name refers to some kind of serpent, something like fierce serpent, splendor serpent, something like that. Um, Coldaway, the archaeologist who discovered this, didn't think it was like other Babylonian mythological animals. And if anybody should know, he should know. He said in a 1914 book, the artistic conception of the Shirush differs very considerably from that of other fabulous creatures in which Babylonian art is so exceedingly rich. Although not free from impossibilities, it is far less fantastic and unnatural than the winged bulls with human heads or bearded men with birds' bodies and scorpion tails and similar absurdities. In other words, he said this looks like it could be something real, not weird like all this other stuff. Bernard Heuvelmans, who's a zoologist, who is also what people would term a cryptozoologist today, he was looking for new species, thinking there were living species still way back in the jungle somewhere in Africa or New Guinea or something. He was looking for all these species back in the 1970s. He believed there were a lot of animals unknown to science. Um, he thought Coldaway's material was very interesting. And he wrote, the Chaldeans were not paleontologists. They weren't digging up dinosaur bones. The Shirush cannot be a reconstruction of a long dead animal, nor, does, nor is it likely to be one of many Babylonian mythological animals, mythical beast, constructed of a hotchpotch of other beasts for while they had a very short life in Chaldean art, you know, these mythological ones, the Shirush, like the lion and aurochs, were depicted over a period of nearly 2,000 years from about 2800 BC to the reign of Nebuchadnezzar from 1146 to 1123 BC. And if, that, if any of you notice that and say that's wrong, this is Nebuchadnezzar the first, not Nebuchadnezzar the second, who's the one described in the Bible. Um, but it was around during his time too, uh, you know, 586. Uh, these figures, by the way, are based on the most recent information about Babylonian chronology, and differ, which differs considerably from Coldaway's. That's Huvelman speaking there. Um, in other words, this thing was portrayed for a very, very long time, unlike all these, other, all these mythological animals. It was portrayed like it was a real animal. He surmised the priests in Babylon had kept some kind of real reptile they falsely exhibited as a living shirush and believed that this fit with the account of the apocryphal book Bell and the Dragon. It's part of the Apocrypha. It has Daniel and King Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel tells, the king tells Daniel, well, you know, yeah, you say, oh, my gods aren't real gods, but I've got a real god. It's this reptile, this dragon that lives in here. Daniel feeds it like tar and all kinds of stuff, and it dies from eating it. And then Daniel says, huh, so much for your god. Um, it's not in the Bible, but it doesn't mean it's not historical. The book is, you know, the Maccabees are historical books about what happened during the intertestamental period. So we at least have an ancient book that claims the prophet Daniel killed a reptile that King Nebuchadnezzar worshipped. Four years after he wrote his first book, uh, Coldaway wrote Das Ichtartur in Babylon, and he changed his views. He said, if a creature like the Shirush existed in nature, it would belong to the order of dinosauria and the suborder of ornithopods. So here's a man less than 100 years ago saying, this thing's, if it was real, it was a dinosaur. The Iguanodon of the Cretaceous layers of Belgium is the closest relative of the dragon of Babylon. Um, if Coldaway is right, we're not necessarily saying that 
the people in Babylon saw a dinosaur, but it was based on oral traditions that were brought back from elsewhere. Babylonian soldiers could have gone to wherever this thing was, brought back stories about it. Um, it doesn't look specifically like any specific dinosaur, but it does look like the way a person would draw a dinosaur based on second or third hand accounts. If someone says it has feet like a bird, like an eagle, then you're going to draw an eagle-like talon. If you say it has claws on the front hands, but they're not bird-like, well, you're going to give it lion-like hands on the front. If you say it has a long tail, well, snakes. Snakes have long tails. Give it a tail like a snake. If you say it has a long neck, well, and a snake-like head, you're going to give it a neck and a snake-like head. And I don't think it's an iguanodont. Uh, Coldway thought that because that was one of the dinosaurs which he was familiar with. Um, although it's possible uh, some of those may have had physical similarities to what a person could then draw as a mushushu. I tend to think it's some sort of a uh, platyosaur, some sort of sauropodomorph creature, and, uh, not platyosaurus itself, but something like melanorosaurus here. Clawed front hands, bird-like back feet, long tail, long neck, and a snake-like head. I could see how somebody could hear a description of that and draw this. That's interesting, but that's not conclusive. So then we look at the head and notice there's a horn on it. It's a little hard to see, but there's a straight up and down horn, and then there's a curl back behind it. Then you go to Peru, and there's a burial shroud with these weird critters with a horn and a thing back behind the horn and a tongue sticking out. Then you go to China, and you've got a Tang Dynasty bronze dragon with a horn and something on the back of the head and a little ridge running down the back. And in China and Peru and ancient Babylon, a long, long time ago, everybody drew a critter with a long neck, a long tail. In some cases, a fringe running down the back, you'll notice on the Babylonian one and the Chinese one, a horn on the nose, and a little thing on the back of the head. Um, now, the horn on the nose and the thing on the back of the head are not something we find in the fossils of that type of dinosaur I was pointing out, but there are lots of dinosaurs with different kinds of crests. And we have all kinds of living animals today, like iguanas and elephants, with different soft tissue features you wouldn't know about necessarily from the fossils. Um, so I would submit to you that I do not think it logical that multiple people in multiple parts of the world would describe an animal like that and draw it unless they'd all seen something fairly similar to that. And we saw this last time, so I'm going to just blaze through here. Um, Bishop Bell's tomb in England, around his tomb, you have all these drawings of all kinds of different animals, bats and birds and pigs and dolphins and snakes and fish and dogs and dinosaurs. These are sauropod dinosaurs. There's really no way about it. There's nothing else even remotely similar to it that you can mistake for it. Don't know what species, but it's pretty clear. Long neck, long tail. The one on the left looks like it has a tail club, much like Shinosaurus. Or, 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 or Hesifoites Helveticus, if I'm pronouncing it right, which I don't know if I am. Written by a Swiss naturalist um, in the early 1700s. Gathered reports of dragons throughout the Alps and drew pictures of some of the few remaining dragons that were supposedly still alive. He thought there were a few still alive. He thought some of them were stories, some of them were real, and they were almost extinct. Out in Utah, you have the famous sauropod. You can see long neck, long tail, four feet little smiley face it looks like. This is very ancient and there's really no creature that's ever been alive in North America that we know of that could inspire that drawing. And if it was only one drawing it would be one thing, but we find that all around the world. Now you can have bad drawings like um, famous scene of Eliezer Maccabeus killing a war elephant. That drawing is so bad I couldn't tell that that was an elephant um, based on the drawing just because I know from the print that that is that scene. I know that it's supposed to be an elephant. A guy obviously never saw an elephant. And there are some dragon drawings that really look fake. They don't really look like a dinosaur. So I can say that guy never saw a dinosaur. But you have other elephant drawings that are still pretty bad. <laughs> but he knew it was gray. It had a long trunk. It had tusks, though it makes it more like a boar's tusk. He knew it had long ears, but he gives it more like a hound dog's floppy ears. And he did his best. He didn't see an elephant, but he drew it based on four or five basic descriptive features of an elephant and then based the rest on the animals that he knew. A horse. It, it's kind of elephant-horse hybrid. Okay, well, we see that all around the world. It's only logical that people were working off of sauropod dinosaurs. So I think sauropod dinosaurs were Lazarus taxa. I think they were alive in some places within the last few centuries, uh, at least. And we're dealing with animals that would, if, if we can demonstrate this, I would love to see people dig into this more, that would really, really throw the evolutionary theory on its head because more than any other living fossil, there are no dinosaur fossils after the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary is supposedly 65 million years ago. There, there are none. This would make them an enormous jump of animals that should have been fossilized but weren't. 
evolutionists do have an explanation. There are three of them. Carl Sagan wrote The Dragons of Eden. His explanation was that our ancestors were reptiles, so we still have in our minds the sub-reptile part in our dreams. We still see the dinosaurs walking around. Yeah. The Instinct for Dragons, uh, produced, I think, in 2000, said our ancestors were monkeys that were hunted by uh, eagles and snakes and lions or leopards. And we kind of combined them all together and made a composite creature. So even though we've evolved from those ancestors, and even though we're not hunted by those animals anymore, somehow we have this genetic memory, and in our nightmares, in our dreams, we, we see these things. So all our, we, we have this instinct for dragons, even though nothing like that has ever existed, and somehow we happen to make them look just like dinosaurs. Oh, let me go back. Adrian Meyer wrote The First Fossil Hunters and The Fossil Legends of the First Americans. She was more sensible. She said, they dug up the bones. They found the dinosaur bones. They found, before paleontology was an established discipline, the ancient Greeks and Romans and Native Americans found the bones. And then she goes through in these books and systematically demonstrates how all these people are saying, no, we saw the live animals, or when they actually did find the bones, they horribly misinterpreted them. When they found mammoth bones, they thought they were giant people. Um, then she talks about how the Native Americans are deathly afraid of the bones. They believe that it's, you're going to upset the cosmological order when you dig those bones up. Yet these Native Americans supposedly somehow were such good paleontologists, they dug them up and reconstructed the animals they talk about, and they talk about dinosaurs, or things like dinosaurs, and yet they then later became really superstitious about it. They, they don't like paleontologists digging out in Montana. They, real, traditional tribal groups do not like it. They believe that it's going to upset the cosmic order, in a sense. These are their attempts to deal with it. <laughs> I've read these books, and they don't. The creationist attempts are much better. Dinosaurs or Dragons by Derek Isaacs. Uh, he was here a while back. I probably would disagree with him on some particulars. And same with Vance Nelson and Dire Dragons. The basic premise that people saw dinosaurs within the last few centuries or millennia and drew them is really sound. So why does it matter? This is why. This is a quote from Eddie Izzard. He's a um, sort of transgender sort of fellow. He's a comedian. And I cut all the cursing out of the quote. Um, which, incidentally, small aside, but... If the Bible's not true, what's wrong with being a transvestite? What's wrong with violating the Bible's norms for marriage and family? You know, so this guy lives out what he believes. <laughs> and he's going to tell you what he believes. Um, speaking of the existence of dinosaurs, he says, it's not in the Bible, is it? It should have been mentioned somewhere around Genesis. You'd think God would have grabbed someone's arm, some scribe who was copying out and said, but before that, there were dinosaurs. Not in there, which could mean that, you know, maybe because dinosaurs were discovered in the 1700s, 1800s, somewhere around there, maybe it is a philosophy and some bloke with a beard doesn't live upstairs. His beliefs about God, straight from dinosaurs, because the Bible doesn't have dinosaurs. I mean, maybe he didn't read the part in Genesis where it speaks about God creating great dragons, you know, that Hebrew word tanin. Maybe he didn't read that part, but he thinks that the Bible certainly doesn't have dinosaurs. If, if it did, they should be in Genesis. Well, they're in Genesis. And he speaks of dinosaur extinction. So he killed all the dinosaurs. God killed them all. Then he went down there and he took all the dinosaurs and put each one inside a stone. <laughs> you know, creationists, you know, they don't know why the dinosaurs are in rocks. Well, yeah, we do. We think there was a global flood. Then he says, but then God seemed to wait 65 million years, you know, doo -doo 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 -doo, la, 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 la. You know, he doesn't do anything for 65 million years until he creates humans, is what he's saying, basically. And he says, so that's why I don't swing with the whole Christian thing, because it's got this 65 million year gap that doesn't make sense. Well, Mr. Izzard, if if dinosaurs are living fossils, and if evolution doesn't actually work, and if the Bible is historically true, then there's not a 65 million year gap. There's a one year flood that lays down most of the sediments, and then there's post-flood sediments, and that's the 65 million year gap. That's just a few sediments that have been laid down since the end of the flood. Um, creations differ upon where that goes. And people saw dinosaurs after the flood, and they saw them and they wrote about them. So I would tell Mr. Izzard, uh, the dinosaurs are in the Bible. Um, they're in the ancient histories. Um, they're there. So his, the reason why he lives the way he does and believes the way he does is based on his beliefs about the world and history. And that's generally the way things flow. Um, and I like to think as much as possible I try to be the same way. I believe that the Bible is historically true, and that's why I'm a Christian, not the other way around, which is not something that I respect a lot. You, you have to follow the facts to their conclusion, not take your conclusion and look for facts. Suffice to say, um, I always close out because I don't like to ever speak without presenting the gospel. And the gospel is this. Um, the Bible is historically true. There's a real world. There's a real God. He created the universe 6,000 years ago. Um, traditional historic Christianity teaches us. There are Christians who disagree today. This is traditional 
2,000 year old Christianity. God made a world without death and suffering and sin and pain. Humans rebelled against God. Sin is God's punishment. Excuse me, death is God's punishment for our sin. God made provision for mankind being made right with him. There was a worldwide flood. There was all this history as recorded in the Bible. It all really happened. But 2,000 years ago, the same God who made the universe, which is, you know, compared to that, nothing is too difficult. The same God who made the universe became a human being. He came down to earth. He, Jesus Christ was a real person. No matter what else you believe about the Bible, Jesus Christ was a real guy. He's as real as Julius Caesar. I mean, we know he existed. There's a lot of debate about who he was, but the books written by his followers tell you very clearly who the guy was. He claimed to be God. He died. We know he died. And the historical evidence is he came back from the dead. If that's true, and you better look at the historical evidence and decide whether or not you're convinced it is true. I, I am convinced that it is the case. Uh, if that's true, and he really came back from the dead, that establishes his claims, then he is, he is God. He says the way to be made right with God is to put your trust in him. Jesus Christ died for the sins of every sinner. Jesus Christ paid the price for your sin. If you're here today and you're not a Christian or you're listening uh, in and you think, wow, there may be some sense to what this guy said about history and about creationism and all that. Well, then the conclusion is not to say, well, dinosaurs were alive recently. The conclusion is to say, well, follow those facts. The conclusion that if the Bible's true, what it says about me is true. The Bible says that every person has to be reconciled to God. In other words, you become a Christian. You put your trust in Christ, in what Jesus did, that he died for your sins, and you become a follower of his. You change your mind about your sins. Uh, God invites everyone on the planet to do that. Um, and those who choose to change their minds about their sin and about their rebellion against God and accept his provision, his dying for their sin, his canceling out the requirement, the judgment that they deserve, Christ will forgive and God will take eventually to be with him. Um, if you can believe in a creator, if you can believe in um, 6,000 years of history, then it's certainly not preposterous to say there's a heaven and there's a hell too. The Bible describes judgment for those who reject God. So I didn't want to wrap up without the point. The point of all of this is that science points us towards the historicity of the Bible, and that points us towards the fact that all of us must make the choice to put our trust in Christ or to reject him. Um, and if you're not sure about this, the evidence is there if you're interested. Um, best recommendation for further study, go to creation.com. It's a great creationist webpage. It gives a lot of answers about dinosaurs and astronomy and just about everything imaginable. So went a bit long tonight. Thank you for your patience. Um, if you have any questions afterwards, uh, feel free to come to me, and I'll uh, pass them off to my wife. Uh, let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that we don't have to make a leap of faith to believe it. Um, we do have to put our trust in you as a person, but we don't have to suspend our minds. Help us to trust you and to love you with all our heart and mind. Be glorified through us, Lord. Give us courage those of us who are believers, to go out and tell others about the Bible and about you and about the fact that it's true because it's not just some weekly held story that a Sunday school teacher taught us. It's something that's real and that we can look at the world around us and see the confirmation of. Thank you for your goodness, Lord. Be glorified through us. I ask this coming to you through Christ. Amen.